Hello, my name is Colleen Hughes. I am the Executive Director of the Westmoreland Drug and Alcohol Commission. And I'm Dr. Mark Fuller, the CEO of Value Behavioral Health. In an effort to combat the alarming drug epidemic in Westmoreland County, we have collaborated with Westmoreland County Behavioral Health and Developmental Services and Southwest Behavioral Health Management to develop an educational video series designed to increase awareness and educate community members. Hi, I'm Dr. Mitch West. I'm an emergency room physician for UPMC and I practice addiction medicine at Gateway Rehabilitation uh, Center in Aliquippa. I'm here to talk to you today about a very serious problem that is plaguing our region and the United States in general, and that is the epidemic of opioid overdoses. Uh, the main thrust of today's talk will be on the administration of naloxone uh, as an antidote for opioid overdoses. There's a lot of different ways that people can overdose on drugs. Um, it can be uh, an overdose that is primarily involving heroin or prescription pain medication, uh, but the truth is most overdoses uh, involve a mixture of drugs so that the heroin or oxycodone can be mixed with a benzodiazepine or with alcohol or with cocaine. And in fact, reports from the medical examiner's office in Pittsburgh have demonstrated that most overdoses have uh, at least five different substances uh, involved. To begin with, uh, let me give you a short history of how uh, this opioid epidemic in the United States came to being. In the mid-1990s, a drug called OxyContin was developed for use in patients with chronic pain. And doctors were detailed on the drug and told that it was very unlikely that patients that were taking this drug could become addicted to it. At the same time, those pharmaceutical companies uh, solicited the support of pain specialists who wrote articles and gave speeches and informed physicians about the very low addiction potential for these drugs. And at the same time, patient advocacy groups who felt that physicians weren't treating pain aggressively enough encouraged physicians to prescribe more pain medication for patients that had chronic non-malignant pain, such things as chronic back pain. Over the ensuing years, much to the consternation of physicians, uh, we found that, in fact, patients were getting addicted to these drugs at an alarming rate. And oftentimes, when they were unable to get the, the drugs, the OxyContin, uh, they resorted to heroin instead. And that is what led to the epidemic that we're facing today. And that's what brings us to today's topic, uh, which is overdose prevention from opioid drugs. Um, most overdose deaths, as I said, are mixed drug overdoses. 75% contain uh, opioids, and uh, we have an antidote for that, and the antidote is called Narcan, and the, the bulk of today's presentation is going to uh, involve a discussion of, of Narcan. So, just so we're all talking about the same drugs and the same medications, uh, heroin is what people are buying off the street. In some cases, the heroin is mixed with other drugs, uh, most notoriously fentanyl, which in 2012 uh, was the cause of a, uh, a cluster of overdose deaths uh, in Pittsburgh uh, as patients, as people uh, who were using IV heroin uh, inadvertently injected fentanyl, and uh, there were numerous overdoses related to that. When we talk about prescription opioids, it involves drugs like oxycodone, which is Percocet, which is oxycontin, uh, hydrocodone, which is known as Vicodin, uh, hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, uh, fentanyl, a drug that is used primarily within the hospital by anesthesiologists, but appears every once in a while uh, on the street. Uh, morphine in the form of MS cotton, uh, codeine to a lesser extent, and, uh, and methadone as well. So when we talk about prescription overdose deaths, uh, these are the opioids that we're talking about. In 2014, uh, it was reported in the Pittsburgh Tribune Review uh, that there was uh, as many, if not more, fatal overdose deaths than there were in the previous years. 
And what the coroner from Westmoreland County noted was uh, exactly what I had alluded to earlier, and that is that although the numbers of overdoses resulting from prescription drugs had decreased, the numbers of overdoses resulting from heroin had increased. So it was, it was an unforeseen consequence of the, uh, of the efforts to curb um, prescription overdose deaths. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the symptoms are of, of an opioid overdose. And by way of explanation, I, I've divided it into two different parts. One is what the signs of intoxication are, and the other is what the signs of an overdose are. So probably the most obvious sign uh, to a physician, to an emergency physician, that somebody uh, is intoxicated or overdosing on an opioid is that they have small pupils. Um, and actually the pupils are, are described as being pinpoint. There are few other medical reasons why a patient with altered consciousness would have small pupils other than the fact that, uh, that they're taking an opioid. Um, so that is, that is by far uh, the, the, the number one sign. Other, uh, other things that you may notice is that patients that are intoxicated may appear drowsy, but generally they're arousable. Uh, most often they're arousable with verbal stimuli, meaning if you yell at them and call their name, uh, they'll wake up. The other way we determine whether they're arousable is to do something called a sternal rub where you make a fist and, and rub it over the patient's chest. Um, and, and that's moderately painful, and it will generally uh, wake people up. Oftentimes their speech is slurred, uh, but not invariably. Uh, more often patients with slurred speech are intoxicated on alcohol or benzodiazepines, but it is possible that, that their speech can be a little bit slurred with the opioids. And generally their, their rate of breathing is reduced uh, but usually they're breathing more than eight times a minute. The average person who's awake and alert is breathing on average about 12 times per minute. So someone who's intoxicated may be breathing a little bit less, but usually uh, there's no obvious respiratory problem. The patients that are overdosing are simply further along the spectrum from the patient that's intoxicated. So like the patient that's intoxicated, they'll have very small pupils. That's an invariable part of, of an opioid overdose. They're generally not arousable or very difficult to arouse. When you call their name, they probably won't respond and they may not be responding to, sternal, to a sternal rub as well. They generally aren't speaking spontaneously. Uh, oftentimes, they're snoring or making some gurgling sounds when they're breathing. Their respiratory rate is generally less than eight breaths per minute, and it's not unusual at all to find that these patients are breathing two or three times per minute. As a result of that, uh, they begin to turn blue. And in fact, physiologically speaking, this is the mechanism by which opioids kill people. These drugs directly uh, suppress the breathing centers in the brain stem, in the part of the brain that is responsible for controlling vital functions like breathing and blood pressure and pulse. So when an opioid overdose is depressing these breathing centers, the patients aren't breathing like they normally do. And when they don't breathe like they normally do, they begin to display something called cyanosis, which is a bluing of the fingertips and a bluing of the lips. So if you come across somebody who you suspect has overdosed on opioids and they're hardly breathing and they have pinpoint pupils and they're beginning to turn blue, uh, you know at that point that, sh that you're dealing with a, with a severe overdose and not merely somebody who's intoxicated. There's a lot of urban myth around what you should do to somebody who is overdosing. Um, and most of these things are not only ineffective, uh, they're dangerous. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
has been done consistently over the years and somehow it continues to live on in, in, in this sort of urban mythology is when somebody has an opioid overdose that they should be put in a bathtub with ice water. Um, for most of us, if we were to jump into an ice cold bath, it would, it would immediately wake us up. But it doesn't have that effect on somebody who's overdosing on an opioid. In fact, a bigger danger is that because their level of consciousness is already depressed, that it's very likely that they'll slip under the water uh, and drown. The other thing some people do is to give them drugs that they think will reverse the effect of the opioid. So uh, we have heard stories of well-intended but misinformed bystanders injecting these patients with uh, cocaine, for example, uh, thinking that that's going to wake them up. Again, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, some people try to induce vomiting, um, but that's equally ineffective because oftentimes the patients that are overdosing have injected the drug intravenously. So emptying their stomach is not gonna get rid of any of the drug. Even if they've taken a pill, by the time they're beginning to show signs of an overdose, the pill has already been absorbed from their stomach. And the third thing is, when somebody has depressed consciousness and you induce vomiting, it's very possible that the person could then aspirate their vomit, meaning they can inhale their vomit into their lungs, which makes a bad problem only worse. But I think the worst thing that you can do for somebody who's overdosing in your presence, and unfortunately it's all too common, and that is to leave the person, to abandon them, or to drop them off somewhere. I have heard stories over the years that have been uh, absolutely appalling about what people who are supposedly friends of somebody who's overdosed have done in terms of just leaving them uh, perhaps outside the door of a hospital or a clinic, or at other times they, they're in the same room with a person that has used drugs and overdosed, and instead of trying to help them or calling 911, they've simply collected their belongings and left the premises and essentially left the person there to die. So these are things that uh, I would hope people would not do. There are some things you can do. Uh, short of giving the, uh, the antidote, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the most important thing you can do uh, until you get the antidote or until the EMS system arrives is to breathe for these patients. These days, the American Heart Association has changed their guidelines regarding CPR. And it, up until recently, uh, CPR consisted of mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing and chest compressions. And because a lot of people were hesitant to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to people, uh, we now have what's called hands-only CPR, meaning that it is acceptable to just do chest compressions and not do mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. But it doesn't work that way for an opioid overdose. And the reason for that is, is that the problem is not primarily a cardiac problem. These, these people do not die because they've had a heart attack. The reason they're dying is, is because the opioid drugs have depressed their breathing centers. And if you can breathe for these patients, if you can continue to ventilate them and give them oxygen, you can keep them alive until EMS comes and, uh, and administers the Narcan. Now, a patient who's not breathing, their heart will eventually stop but it's not generally stopping because of underlying heart disease, it's stopping because of lack of oxygen. And in the overdose prevention kit that I'll show you, uh, a lot of them, and this one as well, has a little mouth guard that you can use uh, if you're concerned about contracting some sort of infectious disease. Personally, I feel it's worth the risk uh, of giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to somebody who's overdosing, because if you don't do that, um, it's very likely that they'll end up dying. So let's talk about Narcan. Narcan is the brand name of a drug called naloxone. And naloxone is what's called an opioid antagonist. So let's 
talk a little bit about pharmacology and a little bit about receptors. Uh, throughout our brain, our spinal cord, and our gastrointestinal tract, we have opioid receptors. And when you take a drug like oxycodone or heroin, these drugs stimulate the receptors and that's how they produce their effect. In low doses, that's how they get rid of pain. In high doses, that's how they depress the respiratory centers and, and cause overdose deaths. Naloxone is an antagonist. And what that means is, is that when a patient is overdosing and there are opioid drugs that are attached to the receptors that are causing the respiratory depression, drugs like naloxone, they come and displace the drug from the receptors and then they bind to the receptors and block the effects of the opioid drugs. And by blocking the effects of the opioid drugs, they reverse the effect of the, of the opioid and reverse the signs of the overdose. As an emergency physician, I can tell you that I have given Narcan or Naloxone literally hundreds of times over 30 years. And if a patient has even the slightest signs of life, the Narcan, the Naloxone will reverse that. Even if, as I stated earlier, it is a mixed drug overdose and naloxone only works on the opioid receptors. But even if the overdose involves alcohol or benzodiazepines or cocaine or marijuana, simply reversing the effect of the opi opioid is more often than not all you need to do to save the person from dying. Its effect lasts 30 to 60 minutes, which is long enough uh, to restore life to a person that's overdosed. In some cases, if a patient's on a long-acting opioid drug, uh, like methadone, for example, sometimes they may need an additional dose. Uh, if you're using naloxone uh, out in the field um, and the person overdoses and they're on a long-acting opioid, uh, this person generally needs to go to the emergency room where, where they can be monitored more closely. The drug can be given almost any way that you can think of. Uh, in the hospital, we like to give it intravenously because it works more quickly, but it can be given intramuscularly uh, into a muscle of the thigh or the buttocks or the arm. It can be administered subcutaneously, uh, much like insulin is with a small gauge needle into the abdomen. Um, our opioid overdose uh, prevention kit, as I'll show you in a few minutes, has an adapter so that the uh, naloxone can be administered nasally and be absorbed through the mucosa uh, in the nose. I've actually even injected this under the tongue uh, because there's a lot of veins under there and the absorption of the drug is very quick. So almost any way that you can think of. if. Uh, if the paramedics come and they put a breathing tube down into somebody's lung, uh, you can even administer the naloxone through the breathing tube. Uh, what we're going to show you, however, is what we think is the least invasive and probably the most acceptable way to administer the drug, and that is to give it intranasally. If you give naloxone to a person who is physically dependent on an opioid, it's quite likely that the administration of the naloxone will precipitate acute withdrawal. So the person will awaken from the overdose, but within a few minutes after that, they'll start to experience some withdrawal symptoms. They're often not happy about that. Um, I feel it's a small price to pay for being alive. Um, the other criticism that I've heard about naloxone is, is that if addicts have the naloxone, that they will be more likely to take larger doses of opioid drugs and, and thereby actually increase the likelihood that they'll overdose. While there may be a few people that would be inclined to push their drug use to the end uh, because they know they have naloxone, the truth is that most people who are using drugs don't want to overdose. Most of the overdoses we encounter are accidental and uh, the analogy that I've heard is much like that with regard to wearing seat belts. And that is to say, because you get in your car and you put on your seat belt, are you more likely to drive recklessly because you have a seat belt on? Uh, I don't think most people do that. And I 
I strongly believe that uh, making naloxone available is, is not, except in the most rare and remote case, going to, uh, going to precipitate greater uses of opioids. This is a very safe drug. We have used it for years in the emergency department. Paramedics have used it for years. It has no psychoactive effects on its own. It, there is uh, no possibility that a person could get high on this drug. If you give it to somebody who is not taking opioids, let's say, for example, they're a diabetic and their blood sugar has dropped dangerously low and you suspect they might have overdosed and you give them the, the naloxone, it has no effect on them whatsoever. It is not going to make any underlying medical problems uh, any worse if you give it to somebody who is not, uh, who is not uh, overdosing on opioids. So let me take uh, a few minutes to show you uh, some of what we have uh, in terms of the uh, overdose prevention kit. This is what we will be distributing. This is from the Westmoreland Drug and Alcohol Commission and it is an overdose prevention kit and it has in it the things that you need uh, to provide uh, 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 naloxone to somebody who's overdosing. Uh, gloves are in here and, and you should use gloves. Um, this is what the setup looks like. It, it has a little uh, barrel through which you can insert the, uh, the medication and it simply screws into the, into the end of it here and twists on. Then you take off the tip of it. This is the atomizer. This is the device that goes inside the patient's nose and it screws on the end. And that's all there is to the assembly of this. It's very, very easy to use. This part is then inserted into the patient's nose and half of the drug is given in one nostril and half is given in the other. Although if in a moment of excitement uh, and, and you're caught up in this process and you happen to inject all of it in one nostril, uh, that's okay. It, it will be absorbed. Uh, the idea though is to insert it far enough that the atomizer, and this is a soft rubber tip, uh, that it seals the outside of the nose so that the drug doesn't squirt all over the patient's face. Um, this is a small plastic face shield that can be put over the person's mouth. Uh, I think that if somebody is overdosing, if somebody is barely breathing, if somebody is turning blue because of lack of oxygen, while you're getting this ready, somebody else in the room uh, can be giving the patient rescue breaths uh, using this face shield. In some communities, Naloxone is distributed uh, with a needle and a syringe. Um, the same drug, the same dosing. Um, we feel that the nasal adapter is probably easier for people that are not familiar uh, with using a syringe, uh, would be more comfortable with. Uh, but if, if you are watching this video and in your community they have decided to dispense the syringes, uh, it's exactly the same setup except that there's a needle with the end. Uh, it can be injected directly uh, into a patient's leg. It can go through their clothes. You don't have to go through all of the stuff that they do in the doctor's office in terms of washing the area with alcohol. This is, this is a life and death situation and the sooner you get the drug into the person uh, the more likely they, they are to do well. There is also the auto injector. And this is, a, this is a great device. It actually talks to you. Uh, this one is for training. This trainer contains no needle or drug. So this, this is the trainer. There's no needle or drug, if but it will talk you through use, it. I'll let you listen. 
it's as simple as that. As you can see, the auto injector is good because it will help talk uh, an uninitiated person through the process of injecting the, the naloxone. It, it has been demonstrated uh, that the auto injector can be used by children as young as seven. There have been case reports where kids this young uh, living in the household where their parents uh, are using IV opioids have been able to use this auto injector successfully. The problem with the auto injector is that it costs around $600. So uh, the average person would have to have uh, uh, a lot of money in order to afford one of them. Uh, for that reason, we've decided to go with the kit that involves the Narcan with the nasal adapter uh, simply because the, the cost of using the auto injector is, uh, is prohibitive. There is a considerable amount of evidence uh, that demonstrates the effectiveness of naloxone administration uh, for cases of opioid overdoses. Uh, Prevention Point Pittsburgh is a harm reduction organization uh, in Pittsburgh that since 2005 have dispensed uh, Narcan to over 1,100 people. And since that period of time, as of 2014, there have been 1,167 uh, overdose reversals. In the city of San Francisco, with a population of 837,000, uh, they have been distributing naloxone since 2003 and right now they experience less than 12 overdoses per year. Uh, compare that to Westmoreland County, where last year there were 87 overdoses with a population far less than, than that in California. One of the most important considerations with respect to naloxone distribution is identifying vulnerable populations. These are people who are at heightened risk for overdose. And there's about four or five different groups of people who we consider high risk. Uh, one of those would be people that are released from incarceration. A lot of the patients that uh, have opioid addictions do eventually find themselves in jail. And with some of the changing standards regarding incarceration, more of these people are going to be released. And unfortunately, oftentimes the first thing that uh, these folks want to do when they're released from jail is to get high and generally they even if they were getting some drugs in jail it wasn't very much and their tolerance is low and even if they know enough to take less drug than they did before they were incarcerated oftentimes they underestimate the potency of the drug and end up overdosing the same thing is said for people that are coming out of treatment centers uh, they've been uh, in an inpatient and have been abstinent for several weeks up to a month and uh, although you would think that when they come out of treatment they would not use drugs the reality is that a lot of them do and a lot of them do overdose some of the treatment centers like gateway are now giving naloxone as well as training on overdose prevention uh, to people that are being discharged because they uh, they comprise such a high-risk group other groups are people who were prescribed opioids by their physicians. Uh, it may be a person who is prescribed these drugs for very legitimate reasons, that has no intentions of abusing them, that appears to be at very low risk for overdose, but they may be taking some benzodiazepines uh, along with it. They may mix some alcohol with their pain medication, and, uh, and these people are also at high risk. The two drugs that are the most risky to take with the opioids are the benzodiazepines like Xanax and Ativan and, and alcohol. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some side effects when you give people uh, naloxone and, and the predominant one is that it can precipitate withdrawal. So sometimes the patients will wake up and they'll start to feel sick, they may be nauseated, they may vomit. Uh, there are some stories that these patients uh, as they emerge from the overdose can be combative. Uh, that has not been my experience. If anything, uh, they're disoriented, uh, but they, they generally don't come, uh, come out of their overdose swinging, which is something that, that we've heard some people say, and, and it's simply not true. The other uh, thing that I want to briefly discuss is the Good Samaritan legislation. Uh, very often, as I talked about in the beginning of this video,
uh, the worst thing that people can do for someone that's overdosing is to abandon them, to leave or to let them lay on the sofa and die because they're afraid to call for help. Uh, the Good Samaritan Law was designed to protect people that call 911. And according to the provision of the law, if you are in the presence of someone who overdoses and you're holding drugs and the police or the first responders come, although you may be charged with possession, you will not be prosecuted. And the intent of this law is to discourage people from abandoning their friends at a time when they need them to be their friends the most. In summary, we're in the midst of a very serious opioid overdose epidemic in the United States that's costing roughly 50,000 lives per year. Uh, we have a drug in the form of naloxone that is available to reverse these overdoses. It's easy to administer, it's very effective, and it has been shown to uh, save lives. If you are addicted to opioids and using them either orally or intravenously, if you live with somebody who is uh, abusing opioids, uh, if you are part of a vulnerable population uh, or have a family member that is part of a vulnerable population, uh, then you should make every effort uh, to obtain naloxone and training in how to administer it. Some physicians are willing to prescribe this. Uh, some of the drug and alcohol treatment centers are now prescribing naloxone to their patients upon discharge. If you have any questions about this, about how to obtain training for it, or how to obtain access to the naloxone, you should contact your single county authority uh, for more information regarding this. This is a life and death situation, and we have an antidote, and I strongly encourage people to obtain the training and have the antidote available for when it's necessary. Thank you.